Okay. So first of all, I would like to welcome County Executive Kittleman here this evening. Thank you, sir, for being with us. We appreciate your time. Um, Thank you. Mr. Weinstein, you've taken a different chair tonight, um, but as one of our colleagues, we're... Um, I think that we know that you care very much about this portion of your constituency, and um, so we appreciate that. Thank you very but much. But, gentlemen, before we begin, I have to do something else because we have a lot of people in the room tonight. Um, the, um, I need to start by recognizing that we are all, there are many people who are passionate about the outcome and what we intend or what will be the best thing to do. Um, and that their um, emotions run high, and as the result, voices can run high, as well as actions can um, be swift and can potentially get in the way of someone else in the room. So I'm going to remind folks that we are here tonight to listen and learn, and that um, anyone who is here and wants to share their thoughts and opinions with us as we go through this. Um, we will have a public hearing on September 17th. We're going to start it at 6 o'clock, knowing that there are likely to be many people who will want to participate with us. I say that because it is a very important to understand tonight is not the night for those of you who are watching and here with us to ask questions. Tonight's the night to learn, to formulate questions, to send us questions that you may have as the result of what you hear. But it is absolutely a night for listening and learning. Um, as with other things where emotions have run high, we've had people carrying signs, and those signs have been raised and have gotten in the way, and I actually do see a sign here in the room. Um, and we've had people clapping or we've had people making noise as things are going on. We will have none of that this evening. If you have a sign, it needs to be in your lap so that it does not ob obstruct the vision of anyone behind you. And I would like to remind people that according to our county code, a person attending an open meeting of a public body may not engage in conduct, in conduct including visual demonstrations demonstrations such as the waving of placard signs or banners that disrupts the meeting or that interferes with the right of members of the public to attend, observe, and hear the meeting. And then it goes on to specify that if a person persists in conduct prohibited by subsection A, that's what I just read to you, um, or violates any other regulations concerning the conduct of an open meeting, the presiding officer, me, um, may order the person to leave because a public meeting is indeed just that. It's an opportunity for each and every one of us in the room to participate and to learn equally. So I'm certain that this was a totally unnecessary warning, but at the same time one that I felt was needed. Um, and so with that, gentlemen, Please do not do anything that's going to make people in this room crazy, <laughs> me included, <laughs> and get, and, um, but share with us the information that we all need in order to understand what it is this, this legislation is um, asking us, is asking from us. So, Mr. Kittleman, Thank you. Mr. Weinstein, it's up to you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Oh, excuse me, one other thing. Colleagues, there will be a time for questions as... Um, at the end for us, right, for the four of us to be able to ask. But I'm going to ask that we um, save them for logical places. Mr. Weinstein, could I actually ask you, and I didn't ask you to do this earlier, when, as you, you put your presentation together, Mr. Kilman, if there's a logical place where stopping for questions about what you've presented is a good idea, I will leave that to you. Otherwise, colleagues, we will save our questions for the end. All right, does that work? Okay, excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Sigidi and members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity for us to present the plan to explain our vision for, for Ellicott City. In four years, we will celebrate the 250th anniversary of Ellicott City. This place has been in our lives and in our ancestors' lives for generations. 
Many of us have deep connection to this town. It's more than a place to us. It's part of who we are. We love Ellicott City. We have watched twice in the last two years as our town has been decimated by catastrophic storms. We have lost four lives. Homes and businesses have been ruined. Weather experts have said this could become a more regular occurrence. This is why we must act now to save Ellicott City. We must be bold in thought, quick in action, and we resolve to get it right. For nearly two and a half centuries, we have fought the river. We have tried to tell the river where it needs to flow. We have defied it by placing buildings on top of it, yet we have never tamed it. As one resident whose family has lived here for a century said, for 100 years we've tried to make the river adapt to us. Now it's time for us to adapt to the river. As I said, we have lost four people since July 30th, 2016 to storms in Ellicott City. Jessica Watsola and Joseph Blevins were swept away in a 2016 flood. John Pasolowski Jr. lost his life while making repairs to his store in the weeks following the flood. And of course, National Guardsman Edison Hermond died this past May as he tried to save others when floodwaters hit again. We cannot allow anyone else to die. This is why we need these bold moves. After the 2016 storm, we rebuilt Ellicott City as quickly as we could in response to residents, business and property owners while we were still implementing mitigation efforts that could, make, that could take several years. That's because we were told it was a one in a thousand event. The 2018 storm changed our conversation. As you'll hear later in this presentation from Jim Lee of the National Weather Service, these storms are going to be more frequent, harder to predict, and potentially more deadly. With all of this in mind, we can't wait any longer to act. The role of government, first and foremost, is to protect the lives of the people who live, work, and visit here. Moreover, the values we hold demand it. We can't sit by and watch this happen again. What you will see this evening is how we developed our plan using a scientific approach to mitigating the height, speed, and destructive force of a flood. At the same time, we acknowledge the strong emotions connected with this proposal. But in this discussion, if it comes down to a choice between saving lives or saving buildings, we choose lives. It's important to remind ourselves of why we are so passionate about Ellicott City. As we all know, Main Street is a destination for people throughout the region and even the world. Our plan will not change this. Instead, our plan will give business owners more confidence to invest here, making Elga City an even greater attraction. Yeah, and one of the things uh, uh, I learned just this past weekend was walking through town, uh, Nick Johnson, the owner of, of Sukasa, who's been here for many years <clears throat> in a couple of different locations on Main Street, in fact. And in fact, uh, most of my first floor is decorated by Sukasa furniture. So, uh, but, he, but he said it really well about why uh, it's worth saving it, because he, he said it we're doubling down. He's doubling down on Ellicott City. He had a great space, 4,000 square feet. His new space is going to be over 10,000 square feet. It's not just a furniture store. It's a destination for customers and for people in the community to go. It'll have a space for people to sit and rest, uh, an, an entertainment room. It'll have a, an artist in residence who will be designing furniture uh, on site. Uh, that's not somebody who is taking lightly what Ellicott City means, not only to his business, but to the community. Uh, and uh, he's, he's committed to it. And quite honestly, after our conversation, he's more confident now with this plan because it will bring the town back and make it safer and make it more attractive for people to come. Elka City is a sustainable community. It also has the Maryland Main Street designation, as you know. It is, as we all know, a historic treasure, and none of this will change. It is our belief that when Ellicott City one day celebrates its 500th anniversary, the community will look back at the decisions we are all making in 2018 and say, that community got it right. The Ellicott City Flood Mitigation Plan focuses on a multifaceted strategy to resolve the complex challenge faced by this historic town. In creating this plan, we have established five guiding principles. As we said earlier, we will protect lives. There can be no greater goal. The remaining principles have equal importance, and we need all five to guide us. We will continue to engage the community. That is why we are here this evening, 
In fact, these conversations started before we even took office in 2014. We established the Community Flood Work Group almost immediately after coming into office. After the 2016 flood, we held multiple community meetings and launched a website, ecfloodrecovery.org, where we published videos, documents, and so much more, including this very plan. Transparency has always been our practice, and we appreciate Senator Cardin's comments about our transparency at the recent congressional field hearing. We must make economically sound investments. Given the large costs associated with this process, we have to find solutions that are prudent. We must find solutions that use tax dollars, taxpayer dollars wisely. As always, the environment must be respected, and as you'll see, the environment will benefit from these changes. We must address the flooding challenge, and we must preserve the historic character of the town as we adapt to these changes. The transformative vision outlined in this plan will ensure Ellicott City immediately becomes sa more safer and more resilient to future flooding. Since its inception, Ellicott City was built to harness the water's power. As we adapt to changing weather patterns, we must embrace the natural and man-made environment that surrounds our community and coexist with it. These are the actionable steps that must be taken to preserve Ellicott City so that future generations will have the opportunity to enjoy all that it has to offer. Without doing this, we will lose all of Ellicott City. People are afraid to come here now, and businesses are afraid to reopen. This bold five-year strategy to mitigate flooding in Ellicott City includes a core component that would address the most immediate life safety threat in the town's lower Main Street within one year. The strategy includes the acquisition and removal of 10 buildings on the south side of Main Street, of which at least three of the 10 buildings are beyond reasonable repair. This allows for creation of a public space, a public open space, with a wider, deeper river channel. Yeah, I think uh, on, on this, uh, the, three, the 10 buildings that were talked about, I mean, obviously, we, we wish we weren't having a conversation about removing buildings. It is a conversation that's been had in the past, uh, and it's part, obviously, of the plan. Uh, one of the buildings, and besides the three that, um, that really are beyond uh, reasonable repair, uh, one of the buildings on the Tiber, is, is, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but it's, it's truly historic. It was, was once uh, owned by one of the Ellicott brothers. Uh, we've started conversations. In fact, I've talked to the building owner today, and, and a plan is, is being uh, developed to, to relocate that building. Uh, it's one of the only ones, honestly, worth uh, going through that effort because many of the others uh, lack the history that once uh, stood in them because of the various floods. In fact, two of them are less than 20 years old of the 10. Uh, so uh, that one is, is, is particularly uh, important to the history of the town, and, and we're working closely to make sure that we can uh, relocate, relocate that building. Our community will be engaged throughout the master plan process to provide input into the design and the use of the new open space I discussed. And that fact, the next meeting is scheduled for September 12th. The two essential elements of this plan include increasing the retention of water higher up in the watershed and simultaneously expanding the capacity of water to be retained throughout the town. The force of the water will be contained in the stream channel to the highest degree possible. These improvements demonstrate that we have a comprehensive plan. It's more than just the removal of buildings. Many ideas were explored, and as we will explain, the recommended plan will provide the most immediate impact in addressing the significant life safety threat in Ellicott City. So uh, a lot of us are familiar with the uh, history of Ellicott City and the history of floods in Ellicott City. So these are some dramatic pictures in, uh, of the floods going back all the way to 1868, though that is not a photograph. Um, and uh, we can go through a lot of detail. I think you understand and have experienced it, particularly in light of the floods in the last several years. Uh, but uh, we are deeply uh, experienced in a variety of floods and the damage that it wrought and the death that uh, these storms have brought to, to our great town. Uh, this history includes well over 20 storms, but you'll notice uh, the bolded ones, the tributary-based ones, are the ones that are what we also call top-down. Uh, these are uh, typically flash flood-oriented. Uh, and you'll see, just in the last uh, seven years, uh, 
uh, in fact, almost seven years to the day uh, in 2011, uh, we've had those top-down floods in increasing uh, intensity. Uh, what we're experiencing now, as you can see, is, is not new. Uh, the th same thing we're fighting now was intentional and critical to the town in the 1700s. Uh, that's why Ellicott City is vulnerable to flooding, right? So on the next slide, you'll see if you look at these maps, uh, particularly one on the top right, uh, the orientation is a little bit different with north heading uh, off to the right, but the, the four main tributaries you see all come to one very specific point at Maryland Avenue. And uh, that is a fundamental uh, design problem, but also a design, a purposeful design that was uh, executed by the Ellicott's when they came to this town uh, to start it and to start a mill town. Uh, the town's built on granite. There's very little uh, imp uh, pervious surface uh, there's just a little bit of it covering these granite rocks. Uh, therefore, there's not a lot of absorption in this particular watershed as well. Now, it is an ideal mill town. This great map, I love old maps, and, and this one uh, I've seen quite a bit, but it features a mill race. What's a mill race? Well, a mill race is, it's, races water down through town, a mill town. Uh, and this is the channels where the water uh, was used to, to, uh, to drive the mills. Uh, and these buildings that were originally put, particularly in this part of, of Main Street, were built next to the mill race. Okay? But then over the, the time, uh, they were starting to build the, the, the buildings over uh, the top of the water, over the, over the channels, which is in the situation that we have experienced, particularly these last two floods in 2016 and 2018. This is what's causing the most severe life safety and, uh, and risk and damage to the town. So development in town, uh, as well as uphill from the mill area, grew over time, and much of this development took place before stormwater regulations existed. There's the 59 percent or so of the buildings uh, were issued, building permits were issued before 1991, when we had minimal uh, requirements for stormwater management, uh, and 91 percent were issued before 2011, uh, when we started to increase, uh, uh, significantly increase. Uh, the requirements for water, uh, stormwater management, including this, this council, which uh, ex increased that in 2016. Uh, and I'm so sorry, obviously Madam we have Chair. different uh, regulations. Could you just, th th those stats again? I'm sorry, I didn't. 59% okay, of the building permits were issued before 91, and then 91 before 2011. Of, and that's of everything that's in the? In, in, the, in the watershed. In the watershed. In the watershed, right. So, uh, Many of the uh, structures and buildings in historic would not be, uh, historic elegancy would not be allowed to be built today. All the new development must include stormwater management, and you know there's there's no no way to no way to manage it in the town except using the streams. So, when we're talking about any long-term strategy for Ellicott City, it's important to recognize and understand that there is no natural floodplain in the historic town. Water flows down the hill in the stream channels many of which are narrow and, and take sharp turns. If you've walked through uh, town, you, you, you see the channels literally making right turns or, or 90 degree turns in, in a few places, as well as going through very narrow pipes. Uh, over time, many of the buildings, as we said, were built over the top of the stream channel, adding a whole new construction to water flow in town. This picture here is uh, 8600 Main Street. Uh, it's up on the west end. It's an 84-inch diameter pipe, and I tell you, when I started on the council, uh, you know, water, stormwater uh, infrastructure was not a skill of mine, but I've learned a whole bunch. This is this pipe's too small. Okay, um, that's very technical. It is, it is undersized. I think is the technical term, uh, and uh, and it's one of the projects that we're undertaking as part of this plan. Uh, it will be increased at least by two feet in diameter if it's replaced as a, a culvert. Uh, there are options to turn it into a bridge, open it completely widely. But the important thing to note in this culvert and uh, among the many projects that we're undertaking here, that they're all related. The work that we're talking about in the lower main, uh, the projects you hear about in middle main and on the west end, they're all related and have to be done in a particular phasing or sequencing. Uh, so that the changes when we make this much larger, uh, that the downstream has the capacity to handle the water coming down. So that's just one example. This will, the, the capacity of this pipe will be significantly increased. So if this 
uh, as I said, if we fix this water, uh, this culvert to carry more water, much of the overflow in that part of Main Street would stay in the channel. This is just one of the numerous pinch points where the channel narrows or turns sharply. Uh, obviously, we can tell from the damage in, in these last couple of floods that uh, water cannot travel adequately through these, these places, and as a result, goes on the street and causing the damage uh, and the volume of water we see. Uh, as we've said earlier, we fought Mother Nature trying to direct the flow of water, and, what inv and it involves the severe storms that we're experiencing more frequently. Uh, Mother Nature is going to take her course, and unfortunately, we've seen those deadly consequences. Now, for Lower Maine specifically, the water rises rapidly from underneath the buildings and floods them through their floorboards and back doors. You'll see a video a little bit later which dramatically demonstrates just that. Uh, three stern streams converge right behind Kaplan's, and that's basically the picture you see on the left is, is the convergence point uh, looking with the convergence behind us. Uh, those three, the, what we've experienced in these last couple of storms is the water blasting, literally blasting through these buildings, and there's a, a little um, alleyway, uh, again, on the left side picture that, where the water also blasts through, and it blasts across the street, uh, causing damage to the buildings on the north side. If you take a closer look at the picture on the right side of the screen, uh, you can see the stream channel right through the building uh, where the, uh, where the uh, destroyed building's floor is. Uh, every drop of water goes, uh, that falls in the, in the watershed goes through this spot and, 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 down, and every place downstream from here. That's why we have such a severe problem, and this plan will fix it. Okay. Uh, you can see the clearance, uh, a couple of these, uh, this is down uh, Lower Main uh, among the buildings uh, we're talking about uh, removing. Uh, on the left is uh, Great Pains, uh, where we're on the downstream side of Great Pains where the water blew through. Uh, and then uh, underneath, uh, the one in the middle you can see uh, underneath uh, Great Pains. Uh, and then on the right uh, is where, uh, what, what used to be Kaplan's. Uh, it's just pretty, pretty dramatic uh, what's left of these buildings. So, again, if you can see in that middle, uh, in the middle, middle of that picture, there's a little box that sort of reflects daylight. Now, the stream narrows to that point. And, again, all the water that you saw, that you'll see in these videos and that, uh, from the constriction point with the convergence point, all of it keeps going through a more and more narrow point in the stream until it gets to that, that spot in the stream and goes through, uh, and that just simply causes a backup. And that's why we need to start on Lower Main to do the work to, and work our way up the street to build the capacity at the bottom of the street uh, to, enable, uh, to enable the work and the other projects to, to move forward more effectively. We'd like to take a little bit of time going through a little bit of the history since 2011. Um, the storm was on September 7, 2011. It was another example of a top-down flooding as a result of a tropical storm. Since 2011, we have had studies done by engineers and industry experts. All these studies are available, again, online at ecfloodrecovery.org. In 2012, the county engaged McCormick Taylor to study the Hudson branch. McCormick Taylor is a national leader in the stormwater management field. Then we also engaged Smith & Smith for a stream corridor assessment, all that done after the 2011 uh, flood. Then the county also held a charrette in 2012 where the community brainstormed ideas for changes to the town. Prior to our election, John and I each toured the watershed with Ellicott City residents. We walked from the west end through Lower Main Street, listening to the concerns and seeing firsthand the choke points and the infrastructure that had been neglected by previous administrations. Within months after taking office, John and I worked together to establish the historic Ellicott City Flood Work Group. The stream channel walls were inspected and replacements were being designed for those in disrepair. Through the READY program, additional work was being done to better maintain the stream channels. It's important to understand that the concepts in the flood mitigation plan being presented today are not new. The quote on the, stream, on the, the, quote on the screen from a 2010 recommendation shares the need to acquire and remove buildings from the floodplain as the most effective flood protection measure available. I think uh, in the same study, uh, they even highlighted that this is, again, the study was in 2010, uh, that in the previous 13 years from that point, uh, that uh, 
that uh, several buildings had been uh, acquired and demolished, three on Main Street uh, in Ellicott City, one commercial building in Sykesville, uh, and then two houses in Harvard Park area in Elk Ridge. So the idea uh, is not even new to, to Howard County. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at the time, the county wasn't keeping great records. We're trying to track down exactly which buildings were removed. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, even the report cites that they had trouble finding it back in 2010. But, but so, so to say uh, that that this is a new idea that we just threw together this summer, uh, it, it, it's just simply not the case. Uh, it's been discussed before, and it was discussed after the 2011 flood uh, with members of town. In fact, the county bought a building then, uh, with the uh, with I believe the plans at that time to demolish the building. Uh, and we, on our plan, uh, will likely require that building and the one next to it uh, and, and turn them into water retention areas. Then came 2016. Ellicott City was devastated. As I mentioned earlier, three lives were lost as a result of that storm. The residents and merchants were incredible in their recovery. More than 96% of the businesses reopened and more than a dozen new businesses came to Main Street. At the time, we were told that the storm was a one in a thousand type of storm. Still, we continued our work to look for ways to improve the town's infrastructure. That's when we re-engaged McCormick Taylor, and this time we asked him to map the entire watershed, not just the Main Street area that he did after the 2011 flood. We put together the community advisory group by an executive order and organized multiple opportunities for community input. This very diverse group met regularly for six months, and we were very fortunate that former County Executive Jim Roby uh, took the leadership of that. And at the same time, we launched the Ellicott City Master Plan process. I'd like to now, if I could introduce Mark DeLuca to talk about some of the uh, infrastructure improvements uh, from our Department of Public Works. Thanks, Mr. Kilman. Um, so as we mentioned in 2017, McCormick Taylor, uh, well, in 2016, McCormick Taylor undertook the study of the watershed and in 2017 released their study and recommended 18 projects. Uh, in August of 2017, uh, four priority projects were selected based on their immediate impact to mitigate flood effects. The strategy of the study was to uh, construct retention facilities, surface retention facilities, and um, improve the stream conveyance. Um, these four projects are currently in the process of being designed, funded, and constructed. And they include uh, Hudson 7, what one of the projects we call Hudson 7 along the Hudson um, branch. And uh, this is a retention facility located at Route 40 and the US 29 interchange. Um, Quaker Mill Retention Facility. This is off of Rogers Avenue. And um, it, it, will, it will store uh, a fairly large amount of water, uh, about 10 acre feet. Um, the 8600 Main Street culvert expansion and diversion, which was something that uh, Mr. Weinstein spoke of. Um, and the uh, and we can, we're continuing to evaluate the uh, Tiber One pond, which is uh, a large, very large retention pond on the Tiber branch. And you can see from the the graphic slide that um, there are 18 projects that were uh, originally uh, proposed in the McCormick Taylor study. And it's important to note that you know 18 projects would take us a very, very long time to complete all these projects. And it's important to note that the modeling indicated that construction of all 18 projects didn't fully address flooding in all areas of the Tiber Hudson, um, in particular Lower Main Street. And as you'll see later, we engaged in a master planning process effort that further evaluated the flood mitigation projects um, and developed some other projects that complemented and improved some of the uh, mitigation results. Yeah. 
Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and, and throughout this process, uh, the community has been engaged. We talked about the community advisory group already, which held 19 meetings in that period between August uh, 2016 and January 2017. There was community input not only through their process, uh, but also through uh, online forums. And, and uh, through this process, 315 project ideas uh, were suggested and, and then prioritized. Uh, by that by that group now th there's a group of citizens and, and uh, some with with experience and expertise in the area, some who lived in the area and had experienced the the floods firsthand uh, but that's uh, that, that's the process that was engaged in and in, in is continues and will continue um, going going forward uh, on the next slide uh, we talk about the master plan a little bit more in terms of what's What's next here? So the 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 we had two plans here: the the, the Ellicott City uh, flood mitigation plan, just to, so we're clear, the five-year plan which we're talking about today, uh, and then the Ellicott City master plan. So the five-year plan is going to be incorporated and integrated into into the uh, overall master plan. Uh, but we launched that master plan uh, once the H and H or the hydrologic and hydraulic analysis was completed. Uh, it incorporated the master plan incorporates the results of the an, that analysis and integrates it as well with with other important elements of a master plan. You know things like economic uh, development, economic activity, his, historic elements, uh, community design, and environment environmental considerations. So the flood mitigation plan will be incorporated, as I said, into the master plan. The process was crafted to to define a comprehensive community driven vision for rebuilding a stronger, safer, and more resilient Ellicott City. Uh, and it's being developed with a high level of engagement. The, the planning process uh, is, was in the final uh, review uh, stage a week before the flood. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, it, was, it was being circulated for, for comments uh, among members of the community uh, as well as uh, staff and members of, uh, of the various par uh, organizations uh, working on this. Uh, so we're going to be continuing it now, as, as the executive said, on September 12th. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's important to note the five-year plan is meant to solely address the flood mitigation in uh, the historic district, while the master plan provides a more, more holistic uh, set of recommendations. So as you can see, so as you can see uh, a lot was going on after the 2016 flood because we thought it was a 1 in 1,000. Then May 27, 2018 happened. About seven and a half inches of rain fell in five hours, the majority of which fell in a three-hour period. The storm came in two waves with significant rain and flooding in each of the waves. In a six-hour period starting at 4 p.m., the 911 center received more than 1,100 calls. Multiple roads were completely washed away. The old courthouse near Ellicott Mills Drive was demolished, and there was massive damage to streets, sidewalks, and buildings. About 40 Swift water rescues took place, including one in Lot F when the old courthouse collapsed. Many of the businesses that had just recently reopened after the 2016 recovery were wiped out again. Fortunately for us, after the 2016 flood, Ron Peters, a very big part of our community, put up a number of cameras. And here's a brief video showing some of the flood with times. So these are a couple of key points uh, in, uh, in town where water, you can see through the time stamps how quickly the wa water rises. Now, this is on Court Avenue right by Main Street. This is the uh, pinch point or the convergence point and you can see that, that little island which had some trees on it. Uh, you can see what's happening there. That thing rolling down is, was a culvert on a bridge leading to somebody's home that was washed away uh, and obviously the height of it. Here pay attention to the two floods. All right, so there was the one that started in that 420 time frame and went uh, to the height. You can notice uh, the awnings where the water was almost the awning. The story of that rescue is pretty harrowing and, and won't go into it now, but you can see just a short time later, it's even higher than it was before. Uh, and you can see the, the rescue, rescue folks uh, there. Here's uh, the, the, the uh, Great Pains in the back of the T on the Tiber. You can see how the water is so constrained there uh, and has nowhere to go but up and out uh, and is surrounding the building. You can't even see the first floor of either of the buildings at this point uh, in the debris. And then this is, uh, you know, a while after what's, what's left. 
Um, yeah. and, and this is what you see um, when, yeah, it's, when it's all and done. If I could just, I could, but, what I thought was amazing also about that, if you looked at the one behind the Tina Tiber, if you watched those numbers, it was eight minutes from when it was still going underneath to when it came up top. Eight minutes. We can't. It just comes so quickly, it's, it's hard to deal with. Yeah, it's a function of really the debris uh, that builds up uh, it, because it's constrained. They are built over the, the river. There is, the water has nowhere else to go. The debris that comes down, the mud, the rocks, trees, cars, uh, it, 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 it quickly gets clogged up and forces the water out. And you can see what happens. So when I mentioned before how the water comes behind the convergence uh, the building from that convergence point and blasts through the buildings. This is what I'm talking about. Kaplan's, what's left of it. Now, understand that Kaplan's, and there's another picture I think we're going to look at here in a minute, um, but, but these are, this is what you see. The, the, there's stuff sticking out of that front building. That, that's, a, that's an entire tree uh, that's sticking out of the bottom left next to the culture lab in the blue building. Um, and uh, you know, I think all of you had seen it walking down the street uh, in the days following this, this last flood. Uh, on the next slide, um, you can see one of the buildings I, I spent most of my time in, uh, which was Bean Hollow. Um, and uh, the, the floors were washed away, the, the, the side, the walls were washed away on the side there, uh, and next to it is Discoveries. The, the floor is completely gone. Uh, there, there's, there's virtually nothing left of the, the inside of that, of that building because the, the force of the water that struck it, the velocity uh, and the volume. Uh, the next one is, uh, is what I was talking about. So this is, this is what's left of, uh, of Misfit, uh, okay? This was uh, an exercise facility that opened up after the 2016 flood. Um, I'll be honest, there were a bunch of people on the street, and I think there's some behind me that didn't know why a, an exercise place was opening up on Main Street in that building, but she was an amazing addition to the town. And um, there's nothing left of this building. The only piece of equipment that you can see left in this building is in the front for, forefront on the left is a, is a treadmill. It was on the second floor. Okay, also on the second floor was a daycare. So had this storm happened the 24 hours before, uh, there would have been children in that building with limited access to get out. And given the time, and you saw the, the speed, and time is really one of the most critical elements of this plan, why we have to do this urgently and quickly. The time it takes for these buildings to fill up with water and put lives at risk and put the building structure at risk, uh, there is not a lot of time for a group of people to organize a group of children to try and get out safely. Uh, you know, to say that we were lucky that we lost one life in this storm is an understatement, simply an understatement. And we all received uh, an email from a woman who lives uh, in the historic district who uh, was at uh, the Phoenix, uh, and she went there for refuge pretty much. Um, I encourage you to read her testimony, which she submitted uh, earlier, earlier today. So we cannot take the chance of doing the same thing over and over again. This building over uh, or close to, if not over, a million dollars was put in this building after 2016. And the building owner boasted that this building was indestructible, indestructible. The, the concrete floors he put in, the steel, rein, steel reinforced walls. If you look at that steel reinforced wall on the right, it's just debris from trees. We're fortunate tonight to have Jim Lee of the National Weather Service, and he's about to show you the amount of participation show you that the amount of participation, whether it's rain or snow, is becoming more intense, particularly in the northeastern United States. As you can see, there's 71 percent. Um, and you also have heard, I'm sure, that in Harford County, just this past week, uh, we lost two more lives to the flooding uh, that happened up there. So I can turn it over to uh, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Lee. I'm the meteorologist in charge of NOAA's National Weather Service forecast office in Sterling, Virginia, and I've been there for uh, 14 years. Our office issues zero to seven day outlooks, watches, and warnings for Howard County, along with 43 other counties in the Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and D.C. areas, including the major cities and metropolitan areas of Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, Maryland, covering 9 million people and 27,000 square miles. The span of our domain goes from the Susquehanna River in Northeast Maryland west 
across to Cumberland, Maryland, down the Allegheny Front, incorporates the northern and central Shenandoah Valley, then east, including Charlottesville and Fredericksburg, and southern Maryland, along with Chesapeake Bay and tidal Potomac waters. Because of its susceptibility to flash flooding due to its unique hydrography and structures built around it, the Old Town portion of Ellicott City is a location most at risk for life-threatening weather hazards in our entire forecast area. Uh, we've had to update this slide uh, because of the flooding that occurred last uh, Friday in Hartford County. These are significant flash floods within our area that have occurred this year alone due to the weather patterns that we've had bringing on tropical flow and Gulf of uh, Mexico moisture into our area along with disturbances in the upper atmosphere. Each of these flash floods forced a rapid and extreme level of water into homes and businesses and constituted life-threatening conditions. Forecasting life-threatening flash flood conditions is very challenging due to the complex relationship of storms, hydrology, and the ability to remotely sense what's actually going on. On May 27th, our ongoing decade-long relationship with the Howard County Office of Emergency Management enabled us to issue a flash flood emergency based on reports from the Howard County Office of Emergency Management back to our office. Is it possible that this year's Ellicott City flood on May 27th might not have been the only one? Well, I'm showing you uh, from this graphic, uh, it's hard to see, and I apologize for that. But uh, here is the city of Baltimore where the green dot is. This is uh, from July 24th and July 25th. These are 24-hour precipitation amounts. And you can see the swath of red, which represents three plus inches per hour, or excuse me, three plus inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period. And you can see how precariously close on these two days this swath of heavy precipitation was to Ellicott City, which is sitting right there on the left graphic and right here on the right graphic. Uh, heavy rainfall of three to six inches fell in a relatively short amount of time on those two days in Baltimore and Carroll counties, causing flash flooding, particularly on the Gunpowder Falls. In both of these cases, the, this north to south oriented rain bands were less than 10 miles away from Ellicott City. May 27th could have also been worse. You can see in this graphic, this is a, a loop of precipitation accumulation throughout the event. And you can see uh, here's Ellicott City, historic Ellicott City here on the Patapsco. And you can see where the rainfall started in western, uh, southwestern Baltimore County, uh, Catonsville area. If that bullseye of precipitation would have occurred another five miles on the uh, Howard County side of the Patapsco, uh, it could have been a lot worse than what you saw or what you experienced. And the second, the second flood wave would have likely ended up being more significant and a threat to human life than it already was. So uh, the thousand-year flood terminology has been used regarding this event, and the May 27th flash flood in Ellicott City was not a thousand-year flood. Several feet of water were observed on camera on Lower Main Street as early as 4.25 p.m. So the thing about, excuse me, I, got, I pressed the wrong button. There we go. So the thing about this slide is that through 4.25 p.m., the 30-minute rainfall was only one inch uh, to about an inch and three quarters in the preceding 30 minutes, and the th uh, 60 minutes before that was between two and three inches. This is not uncommon. You, anywhere in our area that uh, we are forecasting for uh, has between a one and 10 percent chance of that rainfall occurring uh, in that time frame. So rainfall data from the 27th indicates that Ellicott City had two of these events in three hours with a little break in between, and the camera footage and gauge data corroborates there being a law between the two heavy rain periods. But the damage on the lower Main Street was largely done in the first wave. So I just want to summarize that Old, Old Town Ellicott City has a unique combination of hydrologic features, 
stream convergence and structures built around the streams flowing into the Patapsco. This when combined with the following two conditions, soils that are already saturated, what we call antecedent conditions, and heavy showers and thunderstorms dropping significant rainfall in a short amount of time, they combine to put Old Town Ellicott City at extreme risk for the rapid onset of life-threatening and property-destroying conditions due to flash flooding. Uh, Madam Chair, this might be a time if someone has any questions for Mr. Lee, because. Dr. Ball. So just so that I understand a couple things. On your, your last couple points, I didn't quite understand what you were saying about the 2018. You were saying that there was not a thousand year storm, or what was your point by with the, the not uncommon? Yes, the, uh, the precipitation uh, amounts that you see up on the screen there, 30 minutes of rainfall of between an inch and an inch of three quarters is not uncommon. It's more like one in every 10, uh, uh, one in every 10, uh, excuse me, one and a 10% chance of occurrence. The, the key thing is, is these antecedent conditions that I've, I talked about, the saturated soils, because we've been in this persistence uh, flow pattern since April, that has really moistened up the infrastructure and has really contributed mightily to the number of flash flood events that we've seen in our region. Okay. And, oh, did you want to follow up on that? Follow up unless you, get, if you had a follow up? Not on that point. So, and then, and then you were talking about the first 30 minutes and then of course then the, the other, the, then we had the additional yes. um, uh, storm go behind it. I mean, combined with the space between them, as far as odds of those types of things happening also, which is still part of it, I mean, how would you look at that as far as from a likelihood? I mean, I understand what you're saying with each of the two of them being, you know, lower likelihoods or higher likelihoods than, than uh, the, the 2016 event, but combined with the little separ the small separation that there was. Yes, uh, because again, the antecedent conditions were so moist and we've had so much rainfall since April. That amount of rainfall and the air masses that we've seen this summer w would not be surprising. That's why we had so many of these events that I showed you on the map. They, they could have occurred anywhere. The thing about the Ellicott City aspect, though, is that you have all the drains converging in Old Town and then you have structures built upon it. Go ahead. So the, the, the first map, I think, either just before when you first sat down that had the map of the United States that talked about, I think it was the frequency and the intensity of storms and how um, you anticipate they are growing or have grown. I, can you just speak to that map a little bit more? Yes. Um, the four, that the, one. The responsibility that, that our office has is to forecast zero to seven days. This is another part of NOAA that I can't speak to, but I would be glad to get the council in contact with the people who produce this chart. Okay, so just, and if you can share it or somebody can follow up, what I'm trying to understand is exactly what does this mean? What's the date of this? Is this something that we just came up with over the last month or five years ago? Is this, uh, you say this is a nationwide trend, were the trend points or could it just be that we've seen that this year because of what you uh, you talked about the attribution of the extra moisture from april forward or so I just i want to better understand this so that we can understand planning moving forward if that's is that clear for whoever's taking notes to follow up yeah i think that it's a it's a good question there was a an article in the new york times just in june or july uh, they talked a little bit about this, but just talked about other scientific studies being done by universities about the volume uh, and the changing uh, climate and what impact that's having in terms of, of this. So there are other numbers. I've seen uh, a similar map which looks at the eastern seaboard and talks about a 51 percent increase in the severity of storms on the eastern seaboard. So uh, this, in the, the way that the data is mixed here, I would appreciate as well that, to see the data from NOAA, but uh, I'll right. also try and share that that uh, article from the New York and, Times. And, and I think it'll help us as we're planning. If we're like this aspect of the plan is a five-year plan, if we're trending where by the time we get to the end of the five years, we're not even going to address where we're trying to go, then maybe now is the time or are we going to be ahead of it? And this is 
50 years from now. So I'm just trying to understand the data so that we can align it with our planning a little bit better. And I guess to that point, uh, I'm going to just put one, put one plug in, <laughs> and that is uh, this council did pass a moratorium to allow, in fact, that more uh, forward-looking planning as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, public works, and we've talked with uh, Mr. DeLuca about using different types of models to look at uh, rain data uh, specific to Ellicott City. And I know they've talked to the National Weather Service as well to provide additional supporting data that we create a model that I would recommend for the next council and, and, and uh, as DPW continues to work on these projects, recommend creating a model specific to Howard County, Ellicott City. So I have two, two more things. Um, so along those lines, from looking at that, that chart, I think I did actually understand it, but it was only through 2012. So it looked like it was just grabbed, it was available. Um, so possibly to the extent they have updated information that would give us, you know, whether 15, 16, 7, whatever they've got available, and maybe even give us, you know, what, you know, what percentage, you know, what was that level in general, because they were talking about volume during the 1%. So they were talking about the increase in the amount of of, of rainfall percentage-wise during the, one, the, the heaviest 1% of the storms. So if, if that can be updated. And then the other, and you know, I can go through this, but this is more for the public on this part of it, is the whole thing of one in a thousand uh, storm. Uh, and, and while you were going and talking about how 2018 really wasn't another one in 1,000, um, is, you know, from my understanding, and just maybe correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll just go through it, is one, one in a thousand, I mean, just like with, you know, if you were playing, not that I play it, but if you're playing the, playing the pick, whatever, the pick three would be the, the one in a thousand. You know, I went and looked, and, you know, this year, you know, and, the, and during the day, the, the ones had one number repeat four or five times, and a lot of other numbers that have not been called at this point. And that it's just because it's one in a thousand doesn't mean that it's only going to happen every thousand years. Uh, Mr. Fox, uh, I, I like your point. Uh, and what I would say is, is again, uh, did not expect to, to learn as much about hydrology, hydrologics, or weather in these four years. But um, I honestly don't know that the, the terminology is as important as the facts, the actual. I, and, and I don't I, think I, you're not I suggesting, you. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that you're suggesting the numbers are more important. We have this conversation in other yep. topics. But, um, but I think it's really important to, to see the local trend in going back to 2011, 2000. I, I, yeah. I agree, but that's just for, for some sure, people no, no, I, I agree. Going, it, saying, is it, is it really one in a thousand right. or, or whatever? And then I also understand there's the, the trend side of it, too, right, right. which things even are increasing in intensity mm -hmm. or whatever. So, um, no, I, got, I, I definitely got that. Great. Thank so, you, sir. So, Mr. Fox, if you'll stop for a minute, um, and Mr. Weinstein, if you'll stop for a minute. I think Mr. Lee actually was... You you in, you seem to indicate that you wanted to respond to what Mr. Fox had said. Well, just the, the nomenclature one in a thousand, from a statistical standpoint, it's less than 0.1 percent of the time. And you're right, you can go play the lottery, and even though the odds are against you, those are still the odds. That's right. Okay. Exactly. So you're confirming. And, and actually, I didn't even notice this until you put up the history earlier in the 1800s is the two other tributary ones were actually three years apart back then in the 1800s. And I don't know what their level of the storm was and all that uh, and everything, I'm sort of curious. But, you know, there was a three-year gap then, and then there was another, whatever, 100 years before, you know, you had another tributary one, and then there was a handful again, and then another, you know, period of time. So some of it seems to come, unfortunately, in waves. Keep going. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. I appreciate that. And so I think you guys, after we have been talking with him, you can see again why we're so concerned and we want to make sure that we do something soon. Um, we must protect the life safety of our residents, business and property owners, and visitors. The safety of our first responders cannot be overlooked. And if I recall correctly, I know we have Acting Chief Merson here. Uh, there was a police officer and a firefighter who both were in harm's way in the most recent flood in May. I think that's correct. So many options for reducing the impact of flooding in Ellicott City, particularly the significant damage to the lower end of Main Street, were considered and modeled. On lower Main Street, the ability to open the first floor of the buildings to allow floodwaters to enter the roadway was examined so that the existing buildings could remain. The results showed that the stream channel remained dangerously constricted under that model. 
Additionally, the models identified the continued possibility of debris catching on the supporting structures, forcing flood waters back into the roadway. Thus, the ability to mitigate the impact of flooding on Main Street would be significantly limited if these structures remained over the channel. Another option we explored to remove the backs of the buildings that span the channel and were often built years after the original front parts of the current buildings, as Councilman Weinstein was talking about earlier. But by removing those additions, the channel would not have constraints of the building blocks blocking the flow of the water to a specific height. Although this option might preserve the facades of some, the results showed that the water depth on Lower Main Street did not decrease significantly. And also, again, Chief Merson is here uh, to, to confirm if you have any questions. The fire department has expressed serious concerns about saving facades only as they tend to be very unstable during these types of storms. Expanding the stream channels and floodplain in strategic locations was an important option explored. The reduction in flood water that would result from expanding the stream channel and the floodplain clearly was the best plan to mitigate the life safety risk of flooding in Ellicott City, particularly on the lower end of Main Street. Uh, and now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Brooks from McCormick Taylor uh, to give you, to go through the different models to make sure you can understand where we are coming from and their help. So thank you, Mr. Brooks. Thank you. Uh, as you heard, uh, after the 2011 flood, McCormick Taylor was asked to uh, do a limited analysis, uh, hydraulic analysis of just the Hudson branch uh, from the west end through lot D. And following the 2016 event, we were asked to do a more comprehensive uh, study which looked at the hydraulics of the entire watershed, or hydrology of the entire watershed and the hydraulics from uh, Route 29 all the way down to uh, the Patapsco River. So as part of this study, uh, we established the hydrology for the watershed, um, created a two-dimensional hydraulic model uh, of the uh, Tiber-Hudson uh, channels, um, and uh, calibrated our results that we achieved you know, in the office against the many videos and uh, anecdotal information uh, with the purpose of establishing a baseline uh, with that 2016 storm in order that uh, improvements could be uh, compared against that baseline. Um, it's worth noting, uh, and what you'll see here today uh, continues to use the data from the 2016 storm. Uh, the 2018 storm, although a different storm event, as you heard from Mr. Lee, uh, was uh, similar in scale. Uh, so in the interest of being expeditious, we've continued to use the uh, 2016 data, again, as a baseline for comparing uh, these various, um, various improvements and what they mean to water surface velocity and other parameters. So um, the results of the study of the 2016 storm, which were uh, presented in these chambers in May of 2017, uh, you can see here the water depth uh, throughout Main Street and the Hudson Tiber, uh, with, of course, the worst flooding occurring uh, down at the lower Main Street area. You know, worth noting here is that even in the areas of um, lesser depth of flooding throughout Main Street, as you saw in some of those videos, uh, it doesn't take a lot of water to carry away a car. Um, and, uh, you know, as noted up on the screen, that six inches of water can knock over an adult. Uh, it's not just the six inches, it's really the velocity of that water and how quickly that is moving through the area uh, that matters as well. So uh, part of the study also examined the, the velocity of the water you know, relative to that storm event, as you can see here, uh, particularly down once you get in the Lot D area all the way down to Patapsco. Uh, you've got areas where the water is moving over 12 feet per second in some cases up to 20 feet per second, which again is consistent with what you saw in those videos. That type of velocity and the force behind it is really what uh, creates destructive uh, you know, conditions like, like we saw throughout that area. So another uh, component of the velocity is the, the shear stress and the force associated with that. And again, uh, what the model tells us uh, when the channel gets to that point where it has nowhere to go but up uh, in the vicinity of the Kaplan's building, uh, that's exactly what it did, and it, it resulted in very high uh, shear forces coming through the building uh, in order, because again, the force of that water had needed somewhere to go when it's confined on three sides, uh, and that is why we saw such a focused uh, destruction in those uh, buildings, particularly in that one area. So this is just a close-up of the uh, uh, 
2016 flood model on Lower Main Street. Again, you can see uh, those areas with um, six to eight or over eight feet of depth uh, in Main Street itself, um, as well as around a number of the buildings here. Again, the average velocity you know, through this area for this condition uh, is over 11 feet per second, which is very, very fast and can associated with a lot of force and destruction. So uh, following the 2018 event, uh, McCormick Taylor was asked to go back and look at a number of options that you've heard outlined here tonight uh, to see what kind of changes would result in the hydraulic model if those options uh, were pursued. Uh, so the first one that you see up here is the open first floor model where those uh, historic buildings would be put on piers for the uh, first floor. Um, again, the effectiveness of this, it's somewhat effective. However, there are significant concerns uh, with uh, the debris catching associated with uh, these piers and also just that um, it's still, we're still looking at 8.2 feet per second in this iteration of velocity. So we're still talking about a lot of water uh, coming through there. Uh, now, this was a, an option that was looked at as part of the master planning effort, uh, which is a large culvert, a uh, 16 by 10 culvert that would go down the center of Lower Main Street uh, to help uh, carry that water through. A couple things to note about this, I guess, first of all, you can see by the colors, we're still in that you know, six to eight foot of uh, flood depth, so the effectiveness there is still limited. Uh, also, a, a big concern, too, is the constructability. Uh, of this structure because it would essentially amount to closing Lower Main Street to traffic for an extended period of time, at least several months, in order to build this uh, conveyance underneath Main Street. And of course, the impact associated with uh, businesses in that area would be significant. Uh, and the uh, you know effectiveness, again, we're still, still seeing a lot of water down through there and velocities uh, seven and a half to eight feet per second on average. So this is uh, the model where the backs of the buildings were removed, so the facades were kept in place, and the structures over the river itself were removed. So you didn't have the um, you know, nowhere to go but up uh, scenario going there. And as you can see, we, we do start to see a little bit of reduction over existing conditions, but still uh, substantial um, flooding on Lower Main Street, as well as velocities over eight feet per second. So we're we're zeroing in on you know, some slight improvements, but still looking to do, uh, to do more. Uh, so this next uh, option here, this is the uh, expanded stream channel model, whereby uh, the buildings uh, from Kaplan's on down are shown removed, and that area is uh, utilized to grade in a wider uh, floodplain adjacent to the channel to mimic more of what a natural uh, stream channel uh, would do, which is that it wants to when it hits around a you know, five-year storm event, it wants to spill out into its floodplain. So one notable feature of this, uh, uh, this iteration of the model, as you can see, uh, we've got our velocities down below uh, seven feet per second, 6.7, and also we're starting to get reductions down into more of the four, four to six foot range, whereas we were in under you know, current conditions over eight feet through that section of Main Street. This, iteration actually allows some of that water from Main Street to spill into the floodplain and into the channel um, as well. So, you know, there is a notable improvement associated with that. Now, I should note that, that, that uh, this, all of these iterations do not include additional um, stormwater management options upstream. Um, however, this, this full, full plan model, as you see it called up here, um, is a combination of uh, some of those uh, projects that uh, Mr. DeLuca referred to, uh, Quaker Mill and the Hudson 7 uh, facility um, <coughs> uh, associated, and also some of the master planning efforts uh, upstream as well, along with um, improving uh, the culverts uh, in the vicinity of the B&O Museum here, uh, where the water ultimately hits a pinch point as it goes under Maryland Avenue. And as you can see, we're getting, now we're even down into the you know, four to six foot range. So we've reduced you know, floodwaters here by you know, four feet or more through a large stretch of Main Street. And we've also, the associated velocities with this are more on the lines of four and a half feet per second. So, you know, looking at the existing conditions today in that storm of 11 feet per second, you know, you've now significantly reduced the force, the destructive force of the water 
along Main Street itself by allowing it uh, to get more into the channel. Mr. Mr. Brooks, I'm just going to interrupt for one quick second to, sure. to highlight something on the last on the last slide. Mm -hmm. So um, on the uh, on the lower end uh, of town, uh, right around here, you'll note the buildings are actually uh, actually raised. They're not they're not at ground level. Uh, the, some of them have one or two steps up uh, and are, are higher uh, than the, the ground level. Uh, in addition, uh, a couple of them, the um, this uh, this. Uh, building right here is uh, Georgia Grace. They, they are, will be re reopening actually next weekend, I believe, or this upcoming weekend, and uh, have done considerable flood proofing here. Uh, I know the, the folks at Forget Me Not are looking at significant flood proofing as well and, and uh, addressing uh, what they keep on their first floor. And that's been a general trend. And as, as you know, we voted uh, in the budget as well this year uh, some additional, some grant money for flood proofing. Uh, in the historic in the historic district, uh, so it's one element that that by reducing uh, in some areas by greater than 50 percent the amount of water uh, combined with flood proofing, uh, minimizing the impact uh, of the of any any subsequent flood in, in that particular area. And I think also we should point out the velocity too, because if the water is not coming down as fast, it's not banging into those buildings, then it might rise up a little bit, but it'll come back down. It won't be banging into them and causing some of the structural damage that we saw in 2018, 2016. Mr. Fox has a question. Yeah, would, would it be possible also to get this map that with, I guess, the level that would be level like above, like the culvert or whatever? So, for example, we're seeing eight feet. That's where your culvert is, which is X feet in depth. So it's really not that, but something that would sort of show us, you know, just the amount that would be, you know, over at, at full scale during a storm, if that makes sense. Any, I would say that uh, any maps that you would like to see, uh, the requests could come through Mr. DeLuca here. Okay, Mr. DeLuca. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm asking, I guess, first? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. We can talk. Yeah. Okay, together. all right. Thank you. So... I was, going to, I was going to say, are there any other questions for Mr. Brooks now? Because I think that's, I think we're going to go on to Mr. DeLuca now. So I don't know if anyone has any other questions for Mr. Brooks. Well, just in general, just, just for public right now, the depth of that, of generally what you're talking about for the depth of that channel when we're seeing 8 plus, what's the depth of that channel? Uh, the channel itself? Yeah. Uh, it's, as you can see, going underneath the buildings, it's 8 to 10 feet deep. So that's why it's one point right. out. So when we're seeing 8 to, yeah. right, it, it, it'll remain in the, Channel. That right. right, and I think er, earlier what we said, what we said, I think Mr. Lucas said it too. There'll be places in which the water now, with without those buildings there, and, and the same thing will occur on the west end too, with some of the properties that might be acquired and uh, removed there, where it will provide greater opportunities for the water to return to the river. As we said at the very beginning, the idea is to allow the the water to flow where it will. So it's uh, if you know the the term is paving the cow paths, right? Is is we know where the water goes, where it wants to go, uh, and we have these great models that help us with that. Um, so so we can make those adjustments in, in those various in those various places. And, and part of the, the the plan is 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 to is to deepen the channel as well as widen it. So there's 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 multiple elements to that. So I just want to reiterate <clears throat> the uh, concept. Uh, what I, what I said before was that even with all 18 projects, um, there's a limited uh, amount of uh, flood reduction. So any, any mitigation effort that we have moving forward has already been discussed. Any mitigation effort we have moving forward really is a combination of a few different types of uh, techniques. One of them is to have structural solutions where we're trying to retain the water and hold it back and release it at a, uh, a, at a different time or at a different rate so that it can stay in the channel. Another is to improve the conveyance so that's not, so the, the channel itself and the culverts, it's not popping out, getting onto the street, running down the street, and having the street act as the, the culvert, right? And then also, um, so then we're talking about widening out, flattening out, creating floodplains for the, uh, the stream to eventually have, and that would reduce uh, the, the, um, the height of the water and also the velocity. And even with all that, there's still water on the street, but then we have the flood proofing element, okay? 
So we're trying to, it's a lot easier for us to protect the buildings with flood proofing techniques. Um, if we've reduced the amount, the height of the water, the elevation of the water, and the velocity of the water. So it's a multi, uh, multifaceted approach to how we can uh, deal with uh, these types of floods uh, in Ellicott City. So we talked about the uh, expanded stream model on the previous slide, and that's at the very base of the watershed at the Patapsco River, and then moving up. And phasing is important. It was said a couple of times. I just want to reiterate that. Phasing is important. We want to start at the bottom of the watershed and work our way up and um, analyze it as we move up the watershed um, so that we know ultimately what capacity we have at the base. And then uh, if we do have any kind of restrictions or limitations as we move up, we know how to design for them because we know the maximum amount that we can accept at the bottom. So we also talked about the master planning effort that's going on and how it's complementing um, the uh, flood mitigation plan that we had put together previously. And this is, I would call these uh, enhancements the spot, spot enhancements um, at, at particular spots within the watershed, within the Tiber Hudson that uh, the master planning team has addressed. And, and the, the first one is this, uh, known as the Hudson Bend. Now the Hudson Bend, and I'll point it out, is um, here's Ellicott Mills Drive, and of course this was the culvert that got blown out that's now under construction, and I'll talk about that in a second. But coming up from Main Street, uh, the Hudson Bend would go um, from west to east, is going to go from um, lot F travel behind the buildings uh, on Main Street, go through Court Avenue, through parking lot E, and right now it makes some really hairpin 90 degree turns under the brew pub, goes under a very undersized culvert at Main Street, and then goes under La Palapa, and then pops out in lot D right here, and then eventually goes back into a channel um, right at the end of uh, lot D at um, Hamilton Street, which you, you really can't see, but Hamilton Street's right here pops back into the channel. So what the Hudson Bend proposes is that um, the, uh, the, the channel would be enlarged uh, significantly. And uh, there might be a relocation of the brewery annex building and a temporary relocation of Sukasa, so, I mean, uh, La Palapa, so that uh, we can, and, and also a new culvert put in, so that we can uh, have a much larger uh, channel going through here uh, to prevent some of the flooding. It floods right here right now, pops out, goes down onto Main Street, and of course Main Street then becomes the conduit, and that's a problem at the lower end of Main Street right here. Uh, this becomes uh, enlarged, and then of course the master planning team has some ideas uh, which they'll be presenting about um, how how to uh, develop and regain parking spaces in Lot D and also provide some other uh, opportunities for some of the retail that might be displaced by the, um, by the enlargement of this channel. Uh, so that's the Hudson Bend. Um, the, Mark, the, if, I, if I can just interrupt mm -hmm. for, for one quick second about, about the Hudson Bend. Uh, so you'll note this, is, uh, this was part, as you said, about the master plan. So this was developed and in, in being reviewed as of March of, of this year before the, the May flood. And also to note, again, some of the discussion and most concern about the plan is about removal of buildings. We met with uh, the building uh, property owners and businesses uh, from the Ellicott Mills Brewery and Lapa Lapa uh, in, in March. I'm looking for Phil Nichols. I can never remember if it was February or March. Um, and anyways, in March, uh, to talk about this particular project uh, because it was on the radar to move forward. Um, what's happened simply with this particular part of the project is we're uh, proposing a to, to accelerate, accelerate it uh, sooner, uh, and again, as Mark was saying, because we're expanding the capacity in the lower end of, of Main Street, uh, we can do that sooner. 
that was the, the hang up was if we do that, where's the water going to go once we do that? Uh, and now we, we've, we've completed the, the puzzle, if you will, on, on doing that. Um, but again, those conversations about removing buildings were occurring um, before this last flood. One other point I wanted to um, make right here is this, uh, the Tiber One stormwater management facility. That's probably the largest stormwater management facility. Uh, it's not located right here. It's actually located um, much higher up in the Tiber watershed itself. This is where the Tiber and the Hudson join together. Um, this uh, Tiber stormwater management facility is a 70 acre foot uh, facility, which is uh, very large. It's a very large facility. Most of the facilities that we're able to put in or contemplate putting in are within are in the 10 to 15 or 13 to 15 acre foot range. So um, the T1 facility is, is very, very large. And it would hold back flow and help um, reduce the amount of flow that actually uh, the, the Tiber would experience. And this is uh, under consideration right now. It, it's in the planning phases with some design going forward. Um, but this will be an, uh, this could be an important component. Now I wanted to go back up here and I wanted to talk about, you know, we're already taking into consideration at the Ellicott Mills Drive culvert that was blown out, we're already taking into consideration the, uh, you know, what capacity should we design the new culvert for? And, you know, we're building a culvert to get the road open, but we're building a culvert right now in the middle of the system. Okay, uh, if you think of everything from the west end, which is off the map here, to all the way to the Patapsico, Ellicott Mills is an important link right in the middle. So what do you do with it? And I think the, uh, the design consideration that we're moving forward here is that ultimately this could handle a 100-year flow or the 100-year storm, meaning that we might be able to um, um, retain some water here at the head and allow uh, the water to travel through here without any of the water breaching uh, over the top or getting into the road. So right now this design is a flexible design and uh, the ultimate configuration is going to be once we, once we do the final analysis on the Hudson Bend, um, when we get the final go-ahead to start on the Hudson Bend. So, um, so this is the, what I would call the upper main conveyance that we're uh, contemplating, that we're proposing. Um, and um, this is a significant um, element to reducing the amount of water that actually ends up on Main Street. Next slide. I didn't realize I had the power. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and uh, we've already talked about some of the information that's on this next slide. There are many infrastructure improvements that we, uh, that we need to make uh, to improve the conveyance of water. We talked about expanding the channel uh, that goes from parking lot E to parking lot D. That's the Hudson Bend project. Uh, there are additional culverts that are being uh, studied right now for Maryland Avenue that would connect the Tiber Hudson to the Patapsco River. And this is an important link because um, this is, you know, right now it has to go, all the water has to get uh, out to the Patapsco um, in a very small channel that goes under the uh, railroad bridge. And it's only, it only has that one opportunity. And um, when it can't fit through there, it pops out and, uh, onto Main Street and goes out that way. These um, culverts under Maryland, these pipes under Maryland Avenue, um, they would uh, pick up the Tiber Hudson and carry it underneath the railroad tracks and find another outlet point uh, a little further downstream on the Patapsico. And um, some of the uh, other retention facilities that we were talking about what were the T1, uh, which is the Tiber One Pond that I mentioned earlier, and another is the New Cut Three Pond. And the reason why they have these number designations is because during the uh, planning or during the, um, the uh, study, 
uh, many, many different facilities were um, modeled and um, so they were designated. Um, you know, Tiber had one facility, New Cut had at least three facilities on it, but NC3 is actually the most, uh, uh, has the greatest potential to help. So I mentioned before that really um, the, this, it should be considered a system starting here at uh, the Patapsco River and going all the way out to about Toll House Road. And uh, we talked about everything down at Lower Main Street. We talked about the Hudson Bend. We talked about uh, T1, the potential for T1 and its contribution in, in um, retaining some water um, that would get into Lot D at the Hudson Bend. And some of the other projects we talked about were improving conveyances along, the, uh, along West Main. Uh, there are several opportunities to do that. And uh, starting out at the westernmost part, um, we're looking at Papillon Drive, the crossing right there, that culvert is undersized. Water pops out of it right now. We're looking at potentially uh, what we can do in that area to enlarge the culvert so that we can keep the water that is in the stream at this particular point, trying to keep it into the stream and, and not popping out right here as it crosses under West Main Street onto West Main Street. Um, there are two opportunities here um, where it crosses, the water comes along the south side of Main Street, crosses over to the north side uh, through a culvert that needs to be, uh, that conveyance needs to be improved travels for some distance along the north side, cuts back underneath of, Main Street, of West Main Street, and that's another culvert that needs to be uh, evaluated and, and uh, enlarged. And then the sweeping, trying to make the river sweep instead of do 90 degrees in this area right here, and then also to expand out uh, as it go at this culvert, this is the 8600 culvert, um, we've talked about that a couple of times as it goes back across Main Street, uh, West Main Street, but then also trying to create an opportunity here along this part of the stream by uh, creating, flattening out the, uh, the uh, channel so that we can uh, slow down the velocity as it goes through an enlarged culvert here and stopping it from popping out as it would right here to go back onto Main Street. And there, there are several other uh, projects along here that are conveyance projects that we'll be looking at before we actually get to Ellicott Mills uh, and as it feeds into Ellicott Mills. I think if, if I could add, I think it's important to note that especially uh, not the Papillon Road, but the one next one, those, those are actually things we're planning on doing. We're also just not evaluating it. There's actually a property that crosses over, yeah, right there, that we've talked to the property owner about so we can expand that stream channel. Isn't that right, Mr. Luca? That's correct. And, and then we can make it so. So these are things that are not just we're like looking at, we're actually talking to the property owners and it's part of the five-year plan. That's correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the same thing with, if you look where West End is, where that's West End uh, Services, uh, there's some areas there where there's some properties there we've been talking to property owners, um, as well as maybe opening up the stream uh, Daylighting, I guess, what you call it, right? Correct. Uh, so that we can have it uh, go through there a little bit better as well. And there's properties down there too that. So there's several properties in the West End that are part of this five-year plan as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If you would like, I don't know if anyone has questions for Mr. Deluca because I think that might be the the last part of this presentation he has for yeah. now. Or yeah, I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time for this, but. This is a lot of information that you're asking us and the public to process right now. So there's a couple things. One, is this available online? It is now. It's right now on our web. This will be on. This will be on. This will be on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then the other thing is, do you have or can you provide us with a list of scenarios and the pros that you considered and the pros and cons of each one, um, and I, including a summary of those plans? And, the, uh, and that is one. Another is a detailed summary of what the plan is now. So what are you asking us to approve? What are the things that are, um, being, are just being evaluated? I think, um, Mr. Kilman, you kind of referred to 
some of these things are actually part of what we're doing, and some of these things are just things to evaluate. So if you could provide us a summary with that. Um, and then there's also the issue of some of the land deals, and I understand that those are not something you can share with the public, but if you're asking us to vote on any piece of that, if you could provide us with a, an internal briefing on that, if that is... If that's not information you can share with the public, I hope it is information you can share. But whatever else, those are that's information that we don't have. And we certainly can try to get that information to you, and we'll see what we can do, and then we'll let you know how, how we can get it for you. Okay, okay, so the summary, but you can provide the summary of we should be able to do that. the options that you've to. considered. Sure. And are you able. are you going to how how much longer is this presentation? Because this is sort of it's a, about two or three more hours. Oh, excellent. <laughs> no. Because this is, this is really... So we're about buttons. halfway through. Excellent. John, so, John's buying pizza for everybody. Excellent. I'll, I'll wait that. Yeah. It, j just because this is sort of a level of detail that we usually see in a work session, so mm -hmm. it's just a lot to comprehend right sure. now. And I'm, I'm happy to be mm -hmm. hearing about the, the plan finally, okay. but I mm -hmm. would like to know what, sure. what our plan is for this evening okay. and whether you'll be back at the work session to discuss this. There's, there's no question that, that we'll make sure everybody's here to answer questions for you at the work session. Um, I don't think we have, it's not too no, much. Yeah. No, I think the, no, there's not, not much. Then we'll have Dr. Sun go over the actual legislation because I know that's right. the other part that we want to make sure we do. Mm -hmm. No, but I, 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 I agree with Jane. Part of the, the idea, and, and, and uh, Chair Sigety had asked us to, knowing this was going to be a lot of information, to get it out as soon as possible uh, so that there was time to digest it, ask additional questions that we could bring to the work session. Uh, yeah, so, really quick uh, do you have any working models of this? Excuse me, okay. but um, you can share that request or that question with us in writing um, or afterwards, mm -hmm. but right now the questions that we have are just coming from the council. I am curious if they have working models of this as well, so mm -hmm. that would be a question that I would ask too. And Madam Chair, I don't know if Ms. Terraza yeah. is done with her questions. Yeah. Kind of a, a, along those same lines, um, so it, during during this evening, we've heard about a, a vision for Ellicott City, a comprehensive plan, many ideas that were explored. Is there a way where you can look at the various studies, and you did some of this, the various studies, and talk about each of the recommendations and what elements of those recommendations were taken for this plan and which ones were not and why some were considered and some were not. Like, for example, you talked about the 18 projects, and you kind of alluded to why four were and several weren't. Um, you highlighted the 2010 uh, flood mitigation plan, plan from vision planning on one piece, but if you didn't really cite many of the other elements. So if it, it will be helpful to understand where all of the various plans fit and where all the pieces of the plan actually uh, from where they were derived in the, each plan. Is that clear, Mr. DeLuca? Yes, it is. And um, um, we'd be happy to do that at the work session. Yeah. Oh, this is all for the work session. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, if you can help us align this better with the Ellicott City Master Plan, you know, how will this actually further things? Because at the end of the day, there are, I think, several different goals that we have. Life safety, and that's another question. How will this actually save lives? Um, also, helping to move Ellicott City forward, as Mr. Kittleman talked about, in 500 years. What are we doing to make sure that this is still a vibrant, exciting place years from now? Um, and then, I guess... A big question, will all of the things that we're talking about actually address the issues? So can we quantify exactly what the expectation is now that we've looked at these 2016 and 2018 uh, scenarios and say at the end of doing this plan, we will be able to address what we're expecting if we got another 2016, 2018 scenario, or we won't or we'll address this percentage and here's how we'll do the second part or just help us understand what we're actually going to get as far as our mitigation efforts. And, and I would, real quick, I would suggest to both my colleagues and the public to go to the website and see all the plans and all the, the things that have been gone through 
um, the previous studies, there's an overview, and a lot of this stuff. There's still some of the summary stuff. I, you know, what Dr. Ball is asking for still makes sense to, to you know, you know, summarize a little bit as far as from here to there. But a lot of the information has been there. It's up there. It's been up there for, you know, if it was prior to 2016, then it's been up there since then, and uh, everything that's been going on since then. Um, it's pretty detailed on the site, and all the studies that we've talked about in reference tonight are all, um, you know, there in either, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentations or PDFs or uh, depending on put, depending on how they were presented. Thank you, Mr. Fox. Can I just to clarify one thing? Yes. Um, that um, Dr. Ball said all for the work session, but I want to make sure that we're going to get this significantly before the work session. Thank you. Yes. Um, and and if possible before the hearing, so that so that the community has a chance to process it as well. Um, so, Ms. Teresa, that is why we're doing what we're doing this evening as well, because as of tomorrow, tonight's presentation will be available for anyone who didn't participate with us. This presentation that we are, have all been watching will be posted on our website as well. Directions, again, to um, all of the previous studies are there. It's, this is not uh, a project for the faint of heart. This will, in fact, take a lot of reading and a lot of processing of information. So I do appreciate that you have put as much effort and time and information into this. Uh, and we may be getting a little bit tired, but yeah. and I was thinking this, I'm, I'm a little bit hungry, but that's okay. Right. Because ultimately the goal here is that for the public to have the two weeks to be able to access this information as they, as they go forward. Well, I appreciate you, you saying that in, in particular because um, yeah, obviously, I, I've been steeped in this for years, uh, and it, it's easy for me to, to uh, it's difficult for me to convey the understanding that I've been able to gain over the, that period. But uh, as Mr. Fox said, a lot of this information is, is present, and I appreciate what you said. It's not for the faint of heart, because the, some of these are fairly technical and, uh, and, and aren't abundantly obvious uh, by reading it once. So I appreciate your, your highlighting that. Okay, thank you. We'll move onward. Um, as we said earlier, this is a new conversation. And shortly after the May 27 flood, several property owners uh, came to us and asked if we would consider buying their buildings and their homes. As much as they continue to love Ellicott City community, they felt that for financial, emotional, or safety reasons, they could not return to the town. Let us both be very clear, we are not talking about eminent domain. The county talked to all the property or building owners about purchasing their property, and those good discussions, and we, Ms. Tras brought that up, and we'll see what we can and can not discuss. We'll make sure we work with you on that. But we're having those discussions now, and we feel like they're going very well. As we said, we're talking about a comprehensive approach. This will enable us to reduce the speed of the water, the most destructive part of the floodwaters, by about 60%. And now we're going to get to some of the actual buildings. And right. Now, we talked about this earlier. I'll go through this real, real quickly. And that is uh, these are the 10 buildings that are, are being uh, highlighted. Uh, as we said, uh, three of them are, are, are beyond reasonable repair. Uh, a couple of them are, are, are not historic. They're less than 20 years old. T on the Tiber, uh, we're working uh, diligently to, to try and move that because of the relationship it has with uh, George Ellicott uh, and, uh, and the history there. And uh, as, as Len and Sherry Berkowitz have commented about their building, Great Pains, there's not much left on the inside after the last uh, few floods. And they've been there for over 30 years. Uh, and and, and we talk, we've been talking about the three most recent floods, but they've endured more. Uh, and, uh, and there's not, not much left in that building uh, to preserve. Now, having said that, uh, the county executive has established a, a team to to, uh, of local preservations to, to go through those buildings uh, and identify elements that we can we can save again beyond saving the entirety of T on the Tiber, which is uh, which is a goal uh, and something we're working toward. Uh, there are elements, perhaps, of those other buildings, like the Kaplan sign, uh, that that has a lot of uh, that, is, that is an attraction in and of, it, of itself uh, to, to preserve preserve that. And the, and the other the other the other key part of that is. Um, it's, this is an historic district, so everything in it is considered historic. Uh, but, uh, but some things have uh, a lot more historic value uh, to to the town and, and to the, the character of the town, uh, and, and that's what we're looking at uh, carefully. And, and we want to make sure that as we work with the folks, um, 
who deal with Howard County Historic Preservation and others to see if there's ways in which we, not just a Tina Tiber, as, as Councilman Weinstein said, but also other parts of these buildings, if we could use them at other locations in the town. Uh, and we're very open to looking at that. That's why we call it the removal of the buildings. We're not talking about if we can save them and take them somewhere else or we can use them in another structure somewhere else, then that's what we would like to do. And we hopefully can get some help from the folks in the community to, to work with us on that. Um, and then we talk about once the, uh, the buildings have been removed, what are we going to have? And we know that this will be part of the master plan process, uh, but these are just a few uh, pictures of, of areas around the, the world and the country uh, where people have put like river walks or, or expanded river channels. Um, it could be a place where people sit outside and enjoy their lunch uh, or after hours for a break. And, and as I said earlier, we'll work with the Historical Society to also, some folks have come to us and said, you know, we'd like to have some things there to talk about what was here. And we can make sure that we have things and working with our historical society to help us with that. And we just want to be very, very clear, the community will help us determine how we go forward with this. It's not simply a plan being done now. It's be something we're working with the community through the master plan process. Um, the next page, this, uh, we discussed this when we uh, had our conversation on Main Street. This is Hebden Bridge, England. Uh, this is a, a, a town of over 500 years. Uh, we found out they have very similar flooding problems, and this is what they've done by expanding the river channel and having that terraced. Because as many of you know, and most people know, probably more than 90% of the time, there isn't a whole lot of water running down. And so there are ways in which people could use that for a lot of outdoor activities and public gathering spaces. And then once there, if there is a, a, a larger rain, then that water would just slowly go up those steps and it'd be more of an expansive uh, stream channel. Okay, we're gonna, Go through this. We've already talked about continuing the community engagement. You can see the multiple places here where the community will have opportunities to, to work on this. Uh, we talked about the master plan process. We have the Historic Structures Review Committee, the folks that, that Councilman Weinstein talked about. Historic Preservation Commission uh, will be looking at this, as well as some federal and state permitting. And of course, as the chair has already said, you have the public hearing on the 17th. Next, um, the transfer of outline. Uh, this plan will ensure that Elk City immediately becomes safer and more resilient to future flooding. Uh, again, we'll have the community engaged throughout all those processes. Uh, what I'd like to do now, uh, Madam Chair, if I could, is turn it over to Dr. Sun and have her go over actual the legislation that's before you and she can talk about uh, the transfers and, and where they'll be coming from and, and we can have more discussions about that if you'd like. Thank you. So in order to implement the uh, flood mitigation plan, the administration recently pre-filed budget legislation um, totaling $18.8 .8 million to help address urgent and critical needs in FY19 um, for this plan. It actually includes two pieces of major legislation. The first one is a TA01 that includes $16.6 .6 million uh, of reallocation of funding from existing capital budget. Uh, the other one is CB61, which would rep represent $2 million of usage of um, contingency fund from the operating budget to support this effort. Um, so as the county council probably were already uh, aware of, um, per county charter, um, once the budget is already adopted, uh, we actually, the county does not has the ability to raise the um, geo bond authorization. So as a result, we have to primarily rely on examining existing budget and look at the potential reallocation possibilities there. So we have been working very closely with different agencies, primarily looking at those projects with prior authorized but unissued bonds and look at whether any of this project have the capacity given their current project process um, or current project status. So on um, the, the project listed here, we believe represent a, a good faith effort um, that should have minimum impact on existing projects there. The first one, $984,000, that's from the capital contingency fund, and those just to recognize um, more than anticipate state funding for um, uh, transportation. Uh, grant that is uh, that can be used for um, road repair in the Elk City. Uh, the technology 1.1 million um, project is through um, internal reprioritization um, and based on the, uh, based on the exercise with the departments. And it's believed that those um, changes not going to have any impact on 
technology security or sustainability. Um, next to the Route 1 fire station as well at East Columbia Library Athletic Field project there. Those two projects both have land acquisition pending. And so essentially, um, even if everything goes smoothly, the construction for those two projects will not likely start until uh, spring next year, probably at the earliest. So what we are, um, are listing here or proposed for uh, changes there is uh, likely to have minimum impact on their actual project delivery. Um, by the way, that's also one thing to emphasize, the Eastern Columbia uh, Athletic Field Project. This one has nothing to do with the Senior Center at the East Library, just to help clarify. The next slide is just showing the um, 2 million um, CV61 for um, using the general fund contingency to help support the project. Um, the following slide um, essentially listed all the major um, actual work that's um, represented in this budget and most of this actually some of my colleagues already um, presented earlier. These represent the most uh, critical and the first stage of this multi-year mitigation plan. Okay, that, that's done? Is that yeah, that's pretty uh, much my part. And, and, and Chairperson Sigeti and council members, of course, we will make sure that everybody who has any of those projects, whether it be technology or fire department, would all be at your work session to be able to answer any questions you have about that and about what it would affect it. I know there's some concerns about that. Uh, but what, like Dr. Sun said, that's our understanding that if it is, it might just be a few months at the most, because if we're not going to start building until next May or next, you know, March or something, and then we could actually put money into following year's budget, then it would only be a couple months delay mm -hmm. is what we're understanding. But I just want you to be shared. We'll make sure everybody is there that you can ask questions about that if you have it. Excellent. Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay, then we're getting really close here. Um, in summary, as we've said all along, protecting lives must be our highest priority. Uh, as you all know, there were only 22 months between these two devastating storms. The core of this plan will take us approximately one year to implement. The plan will protect lives and save our town. And I know some people are wondering, why must we act now? Well, folks, another storm, as we've heard, could happen at any time. Uh, we do not have the luxury of waiting. And here's why. And it started to look like it wasn't going to stop. And I said, Gary, if nothing else, just move that one bar, that one piece of furniture that the guys paid for already. It was like over $800. And Let's, we have, we're supposed to deliver it on that Thursday. I said, just move that out of the way. <laughs> well, no sooner than he moved that piece, the water just started coming in. I mean, literally coming in from the front door that we saw at first and fast. I went to the back of the building and noticed water was starting to come under the door that was dividing the two businesses. And that door was locked. It had a deadbolt. I went back to the front of the building and also noticed that water was coming under our main entrance. I stood there for a, mo a moment and tried to collect my thoughts. I thought this is becoming a very serious situation and we really do need to get out. So I said to Joan Eve, I said, uh, please collect your belongings get that boot off of your foot and I will mention that she was wearing a boot for a double stress fracture on her foot and I said you've got to get that off and I said we've got to get out of here. Gary said we got to get out we got to get out of here because Joni we just got to get out I mean he was determined get your things get your things together and meanwhile the water was coming in more and more and I'm trying to figure out what to do I was wearing a boot I had a couple stress fractures in my right foot from that other week of putting all the furniture in and out and I had this boot, and he said, Joni, take the boot off. Take the boot off, put your regular shoe on, and get your things together. And as I'm thinking about the, sh the shop filling up like an aquarium, I was wondering if there would be anything to hold on to. And knowing that in her last business, a white SUV had come through the front window, and everything in the store was flushed out. And I was just thinking, I pray to God that the cars that are floating by do not come into the window of the 
of the shop. So what did I take? I took a pocketbook and stuck it in a plastic bag. I took um, the inventory bag with the inventory, and I took the bills out of the cash box and put them in with the inventory book. Gary said, come on, we got to get out of here. Meanwhile, he's walking back again to see about the door in the back. Forget it. The front door, he went to the front door, and he couldn't get it open. I mean, he couldn't get the door open. The pressure of the water outside the door wouldn't allow him to open the door. Things started to crash in the store. It was, it was almost surreal. Um, I look back and I think it was, in a sense, almost like a movie set where things were starting almost like dominoes to fall around us. It, it started at the back left entrance or, or exit up to the building. Um, a, part, a portion of the wall blew out from the pressure of the water that had developed in the back part of the building. And the showcases, one after another, came crashing down. And he's, come on, Joni, we, we, gotta, we gotta get out of here. And, and I'm walking up to with it where he is, and the showcases from the back had already fallen down, which I didn't even realize how bad that was. But then another tall one came forward, and then we're both standing at the door, and down comes the big six foot tall, six foot wide glass showcase. I mean, I don't think it was a foot and a half behind me where it fell. It was so scary because we saw it on a video afterwards. So I moved back to the front entrance as the floor beneath my feet began to buckle. And I realized that the Tiber River was indeed coming through the floor. So we went up to the, I went up to the front of the building and um, I saw on the street two cars floating past. And I was shocked at how quickly the water rose. It was less than two to three minutes that it went from just coming over the sidewalk to about thigh high. Gary was so smart. I mean, I don't think I would have had the wherewithal if I had been there by myself to think it through how to get out and where to go. Gary had a plan. He took the antique candlestick phone off the switchboard, we had an old switchboard in the store, and he broke through that glass on the top part of our door, and he cleared it. At first, the first hit was it, it was safety glass, so it just shattered. With the second hit, he was going around getting all the glass from around the inside of the frame. I said to her, I need you to hold on as, as tight as you can, and do not let go. We had no idea what was around the corner of the building, but I did know that I had to cross the very river that was raging beneath the building. He said, come on, now you, Joni, you hold on to me as tight as you can and don't let go. I'm not gonna lose you, you stay with me. He went through the door first, the glass, and then he pulled me through. At that time, I probably lost that one bag that had all the inventory and the cash bills but I had my purse and the boot, that stupid boot. <laughs> and then he said, just hold tight. And his plan was to go to the right and make another right and go across the Tiber Bridge. There were railings on either side of the bridge so we could hold with our right hands the, the railings. And I'm holding him with my left hand around his waist. Really, actually, he had me on his back, basically. So the water is rising and it was eventually up to our necks. And I looked ahead and I saw the brick column that had the very last railing um, had started to move a bit. And I also noticed that the last railing was already partially detached from that column. And I thought, if that railing goes, I have nothing else to hold on to. So I got to that railing and I pulled and suddenly I hear Joni say, Gary, what's wrong? I couldn't move. And there were times when he could barely move. I mean, the, the water current was so strong and it was getting higher and higher. And all of a sudden, and by the way, going back to in the store, I said to Gary, I don't want to drown in my store. And then when we're on the bridge, the fence started to give way, the, the railing. And I said, Gary, we're, the fence is giving way. We're going to end up in the Tiber. We're going to drown. I was completely paralyzed by the strength of the water, which was literally up to our necks. He said, Joni, just hold on. Just hold on. He could barely move. Howard County 911. 
Yes, there are two people stuck on Tiber River, uh, right on the river where the bridge goes across the Main Street. They're trying to walk through. The, the water's almost above their head. Right at Tiber River and Main Street, Ellicott City. Okay, it's 8054 Main Street is the address. 8054? Right, and there's two people trying to, to get out, and they're, they're almost above their heads across the Tiber River and Main Street. Are they trying to walk across Main Street or walk across that bridge there? They're trying to cross the walk across the bridge from Main Street to Tiber River. It's a woman in a red sweater and a, and a man. And then he got to that brick pillar that's at the end of that fence, and the pillar was actually moving. And it's slippery, and he's trying to get around the pillar. And I, I don't know where the strength came from, but I managed to pull, and the railing, thank God, managed to remain attached to the column. And we got around the corner, and thank God, the current on the back side of the building was not as strong. On the bridge, the water was coming up, actually in our faces, we, we were keeping our necks like this. My neck was sore from keeping my neck like this so we wouldn't swallow any of the water. And we got around and thank God for the deck on the back apartment of the building that we were in. And that was Gary's plan and he made it and we got up on that deck and we hugged and we kissed and we said, oh my God, we made it, we're alive. We were standing there shivering cold because I have to say the water was very cold and we were both covered in mud. And we looked at each other, and I remember Joni saying to me, we made it, we're still alive, and this must not be our time yet. And that is honestly, as much as I can actually say without crying, because I've never felt so close to death. I didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if we'd ever get out of there. The water was coming up, even on the steps to get to the deck. So we had no idea what was really going to happen. But we were together. And I thank God to this day that Gary was with me because he saved my life. So this is just one story that is hair-raising. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are many many others, including the police officer who was swept away and by some fate was able to grab hold of the railing that goes up to the, the, the train tracks and was able to pull himself out from under the water up the stairs. Um, there, there are a lot of stories like this. This really just comes down to, to time, the short time it takes, as you see, for the town to flood, for buildings to fill up with water and put lives at risk. Dr. Ball asked, how is this plan going to save lives? It's going to save lives by slowing the water and lowering the water. It's about time, the time that we spent, the long amount of time we spent doing these studies over years. And it's the time that is now for us to execute the plan that's before you. You've heard from us. I think uh, it's helpful to hear from some other folks, and there will be some, some uh, quotes in, from people who have sent us uh, their comments that will stream through that you can, you can read uh, at, your, at whatever pace uh, they, they go. Um, there are just a few of these, uh, few of these quotes that will go through. And uh, obviously it'll be, these will be all part of the uh, presentation that will go, go online. And for all intents and purposes, that concludes our presentation, they, but uh, before, as you're reading these, I just wanted to point out that just uh, earlier today, the Ellicott City Partnership, who has been an active partner since the 2016 flood and since before, um, their board voted unanimously to support this plan earlier today. And Madam Chair, I would also just like to say thank you. I know uh, we've gone much longer than you had thought we might, and I really appreciate your patience uh, with us tonight, but we really uh, we've worked very hard on this. We've worked with the community on this, and, and we appreciate your attention to it. And we look forward to continue to work with you uh, on figuring out the best way to move forward. So thank you very much. And as you walk out of here tonight, you already have some questions that need to be addressed. Colleagues, as you um, think of things that you would like um, to be addressed, I think funnel questions to Ms. Feldmark, she'll get them, which means that information will come back to all of us. 
I would invite anyone who is here with us this evening who's seen the presentation and has questions as the result that you would like to see us investigate, please share them with us. You can send them to council mail at howardcountymd.gov. Um, please know that our jobs here are to parse through the information and make the best decision that we can, and we will appreciate your counsel as we do it. Mr. Fox. And, and I would suggest, I know we keep talking about the, the work session or work session, but to do, you know, any of these things as we get them, just getting them to us quicker, in addition to putting them up on the site you guys have for everything, we'll also, right, Ms. Feldmark, we'll put them up on our site under the legislation. Um, and then the only other thing I'd maybe even toss out there, because, you know, I know there's a lot of things that are, you're continuing to, to move forward on is potentially considering, and this is just sort of a request to colleagues, maybe 30 minutes prior to our public hearing, if we could start it early, maybe give us a 30 minute update if there is, if there's a need for one um, at that point. Well, Mr. Fox, we are in, I'm at least anticipating um, uh, significant interest on this particular topic. So we are starting um, at six as opposed to seven for our public hearing, first of all. Um, and that's right. The, right. The goal for tonight was so that we would have this information, and the and public could uh, would be as aware as we are of the information, so that in fact we would be able to hear from um, others at the public hearing. So I think that ultimately what we'll do then is, as we're as we go into a work session, we will be looking at what's changed from today from your presentation, right? And I think that ultimately. I will say after listening to all of this and doing a lot of reading of, of the studies over time, um, I believe that we are at a place where you're describing to us what should be done, right? And I think it needs to be very, very clear that if we authorize the, um, you know, the, the money to go forward, what does that get us in FY? 19, right? And then what are we looking for FY 20? 21, we're talking about a five-year plan. Because if we authorize us to go forward, we have to know that, you know, what the expectation is. And as Mr. DeLuca made the point, we will, and Mr. Weinstein made the point, we'll be working from the river up, right? And that make, seems, in my head, makes enormous sense because it's, it, it is, it makes sense, but it's also then what can people expect as we move up and, um, you know, what does it really look like in term, in that term? I think it is, um, that's where we're going to be making our decisions. So if you can help us see that, right, I think that will, that will, um, that's the information we're going to need. Right. Colleagues, anything else for the, this, uh, for Executive Kittleman and um, his team? Then I'm going to thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to look forward to continued participation. I'm going to remind folks again that um, the public hearing is on Monday, September 17th, and we will begin at 6 o'clock. I will um, order the agenda for that evening based on the number of folks who are testifying. So we do have some other legislation in front of us. So exactly when um, Ellicott City comes up in the, um, in the order agenda for the 17th will be determined uh, basically probably on the morning of the 17th when we see who signed up. We did have requests for, to be able to sign up last week. Um, Sign-ups for the public hearing will open after this meeting is over or tomorrow morning. Yep, tomorrow morning. So anyone who wants to run home and get signed up tonight, don't. <laughs> you'll just be frustrated. <laughs> Please wait till tomorrow morning, and you'll be successful. Uh, Madam Chair, if, if I could pretend I was sitting up there with you and, and yes. request as a council member the CB60, which is the, the polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbon ban. I just wanted to say that. Um, uh, be earlier on the agenda because uh, the students, uh, sixth graders, will be presenting uh, and, and uh, testifying on that. Mr. Weinstein, indeed. Thank you, ma'am. I believe that it, uh, yes, Thank indeed. You. Thank you very much. <laughs>